Welcome to the talk show, Lighting the Educational Flame, with your host, Mark Hoberman. The goal of this show is to provide a learning experience to people of all ages, with guests from various fields and academics, a wide range of industries, and insight into the many forms of art, athletics, and entertainment. We hope you enjoy the show. Author Ray McGinnis talks with us today about his new book, Unanswered Questions. Ray talks about the many questions September 11th families asked that went unanswered. Welcome back to Lighting the Educational Flame. Our guest today is author Ray McGinnis. Ray, welcome to Lighting the Educational Flame. It's great to be here. Great to speak with you, Mark and and Susan. Yeah. So so nice to see you. Ray, before we get to your book, I'm wondering when you first decided that writing was your passion? Oh, I, uh, you know, I was probably, you know, even in elementary school, I think I I, I put together a little play about pirates in grade six. So, you know, <laughs> it goes back a long way. And my my grandmother, my mom's mom, my Nana gave me little books of uh, nursery rhymes, you know, from a young age. So I was, you know, read Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh and all those kind of stories. So I kind of had it in my bones from a long way back. You know, Ray, one of the things that I'm interested in knowing is how did you choose your subject? I mean, needless to say, this is a very serious subject. And, you know, this week uh, was 9-11's anniversary. And believe me when I tell you, and I experienced this, I actually saw the towers come down. But I'm interested in understanding why you chose this. Well, this is this is a long journey for me because I I didn't ever expect to be writing a book about this. I I like I'm, I didn't see the towers fall like you did. I was way off at a retreat center in Joshua Tree National Park in Southeast California. I was the one person who was not an American citizen with 60 Americans from across the USA gathering in this desert setting. Uh, no TVs, no radios, uh, people doing meditation, stretching a variety of, of personal disciplines to, uh, to you know, get ready for the next chapter in their lives, really. And so I came back from a walk in the desert, saw the jackrabbits and the cactus, and 7 a.m., we started uh, meditation and then stretching and yoga, And then in came the leaders uh, uh, who had been on a phone call to the East Coast and told us verbally what you were seeing. And at that point, the towers had been hit, the Pentagon had been hit, they hadn't fallen. But uh, two people in that room had a a financial advisor who managed their stock portfolio who worked in one of the Twin Towers. And and they were uh, very upset. Yeah. And then, yeah. so, you know, it's upsetting for me, <laughs> yeah. you know, remember that. And I wasn't even related to the person that they knew he, who right. lived, but, but, but the, 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 the fear was, was palpable. And then it took me five days to get out of the country. No planes could fly. My flight was canceled. And then I got across the border eventually on a, a slow bus from Seattle up to Vancouver and a three hour uh, wait at the, at the border with customs. And then after that, the, uh, uh, for, former foreign affairs minister of Canada, Lord Axworthy, had a, uh, a talk at a local public library. He thought that if there was one person who was being named as responsible, Osama bin Laden, that it would be best to have a police and intelligence uh, operation to apprehend him and have a, a trial somewhere internationally or in the States and, and carry on that way. But anyway, the war in Afghanistan happened, the war in terror, the war in Iraq. And you know, I'm just carrying on with my life, teaching writing workshops. Uh, yes, the 9-11 commission went on, but reading the news and hearing the news where I lived, it was really a blip on the screen. I did see a bit of Condoleezza Rice's testimony uh, when I was visiting friends in a nearby small town one night, and I caught her during appetizers. But then I was called to dinner and didn't see the rest of what she had to say. And the 9-11 Commission report was published, but I didn't read anything about it. And so it wasn't on my radar at all. Yeah. Uh, but what happened was I was in a bookstore around 2007, and I had finished reading a book in the middle of a writing workshop tour. And I happened to see a book called Wake Up Call, The Political Education of a 9-11 Widow by Kristen Breitweiser, who lost her husband, Ron, in the South Tower. And I was 
uh, really curious when I picked up this book. And I thought, why have I gone six years? I've never heard anything about the family steering committee. Uh, I, I didn't know the families were involved at all in any kind of effort to have an investigation. All I knew was the obituaries I'd read that were republished in local papers in the New York Times. And uh, I knew that people read names on anniversaries, but that was it. And so I began to read the, I read her book. I, I saw a documentary called 9-11 Press for Truth. And I went to their website and I picked up Paul Thompson's book, The Terror Timeline. And I just was compiling uh, news stories, mainstream news stories, just about it. And so it was kind of a file, but it really took me probably till, I mean, I started doing the kind of the research on it. But at that point, I didn't think I was researching for a book that I would write. I just was interested in what it means to live in a post 9-11 world. And so it took me till about 2015. And I thought at that point, it's been nearly, you know, 14 years since the attacks. Nobody, I mean, insofar as people talking to me about September 11th, nobody was bringing up um, in Canada or the USA ever saying, hey, what about that family steering committee? Nobody was saying to me, uh, I would mention to people, I mean, Kristen Breitweiser had written a memoir and was certainly on in front of the joint uh, Senate uh, and uh, Congress 9-11 in inquiry, speaking before them in, in the press and on uh, Chris Matthews hardball one night and being interviewed by Gail Sheehy along with the other Jersey girls. But I would say to people, do you know who Mindy Kleinberg is, Patty Casaza, Lori Van Auken, Monica Gabrielle, Mary Fetchett? They would just look at me with a blank stare. And I thought, you know, these people who uh, the co-chairs of the 9-11 Commission, Lee Hamilton and Tom Keene, wrote in their yeah. memoir uh, uh, without precedent. And they said what these families did and these women primarily on the fa family steering committee, plus Bill Harvey, these 12 people did it was one of the best examples of grassroots democracy and citizen advocacy in many decades. And I thought, why is it that this is a story that people don't know? And a lot of my friends, both sides of the border, watch the news. I talked to uh, a cousin of mine in, in San Francisco Bay Area earlier this year, and I told her what I was writing about. And she said she watches CNN and MSNBC in particular all the time. And she'd never heard of it. Yeah. You know, they say a little knowledge is dangerous, but I, I would say that a lot of knowledge is also dangerous because you have not all the names you mentioned. I never heard of any of those people. So, no. you know, all the things that you said that people do were just for not. You now, and it's hard to believe that 20 years have passed in the blink of an eye. It's even harder to believe that so many uh, families never received closure. Um, yeah. What are some of the unanswered questions that you, you find most disturbing or things that wouldn't yeah. get you too emotional that you could, you could uh, discuss with our viewers? Yeah. yeah, and I'll kind of pick up a bit more with your previous question and move in, segue to the one you just asked. Right. Because, I mean, initially I'm, I'm reading, you know, Kristen Breitweiser's memoir. I'm looking at the 9-11 Truth, Press, Press for Truth documentary and a sequel to that. I, I found uh, a... Uh, a short uh, memoir by Jeanette McKinley, who was a neighbor, uh, cr lived across World Trade Center 4, uh, and uh, called Fortunate, A Personal Diary of 9-11. Uh, I read a number of other books, Rubble by Bob Kemper, which is about the resilience of the families. I read a, a, pa a paper that Carrie Lemack, whose mother, Judy LaRock, uh, died in one of the planes. I read her paper. And I was just sort of getting into like, who are these people? I, I watched uh, uh, testimony of, of the 9-11 Commission by different family members and uh, other symposiums and uh, places where they could be found on, on YouTube um, to, to, to view. I mean, a lot of my research has been primarily, you know, just seeing what people can find because I spoke to just a few family members and a few first responders I mean, initially, I thought, like, well, who am I? I'm this guy over in Canada. I mean, you know, these families, you know, I knew that Mindy Kleinberg hadn't been re replying to uh, requests from the new Newark um, Star Ledger in 2012. And I thought, well, of course, like, who's going to want, you know, you've had this terrible tragedy, an awful thing happened. There's one less person sitting uh, at your meal table each day to remind you of your loss. Why would you want to pick up the phone and talk to total strangers who you have to talk, delve into this over and over again? And so I tried to 
just do the research about what I could do as if I was a student in university and, and, and do it that way. But yes, a lot of the time it was difficult. But what I tried to do in writing this book, which was a bit different than some of the other books that are out there, that are the more hard-hitting political science, current affairs, history books. I wanted to write a book that the people who were taking my writing workshops, people in um, grief and loss support groups, uh, people in uh, journaling for health and wellness, recovering from injury and illness, people uh, doing poetry workshops or going on nature walks and then writing poems. I wanted all of those people who were not very often having a bent towards politics and the news. I wanted them to be able to read my book. And the way in was for me to keep layering throughout my book, throughout each chapter, personal story, personal quotes that, from people at, at before the 9-11 commission, other things that, so that people could hang in there with some of the more challenging material that would be layered with a te, you know, quotes from Mary Fetchett, whose son Brad died, or quotes from Patty Casaza, whose husband John died, and to keep connecting again with the people to hear their voices that need to be heard still. Yeah. You know, Ray, this is interesting because I'll tell you something. I went home the day that this happened and I heard crying coming from the house beside me. And I said to myself, why would that be? I mean, I never heard something like that. And I decided I had a knock on their door because I was a neighbor and I wanted to, you know, find out and help them in any way I could. Needless to say, their husband died. Yeah. And you know, the boys, and that was the sons, uh, became extremely active. They would have been great people for you to interview because it showed the despair and it showed the, 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 just the feeling of what happened to these young men. And to, to date, they're still seeking out information. Information has been given so much, but there's still some out there. Do you agree with me that there's something out there? I know this is not a conspiracy theory. This is just, is there information that we don't have? Well, it seems that, I mean, you know, in terms of the question about the, the family's questions, like, like they, the families you know, eventually, I mean, there were many family groups that formed in the fall and winter and spring of 2001, 2002. And eventually after a rally in the 11th of, of June, 2002, where about 300 of them uh, lobbied with uh, you know, Senator uh, Joe Lieberman from the Connecticut and others uh, supporting them and coaching them about how to get maneuver around Washington, D.C. and Congress and Senate. Uh, they formed the Family Steering Committee. And when they brought their questions to the, not, the 10 commissioners that were now up and running with the 9-11 Commission, and they brought hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions to them for the president, the vice president, secretary of defense, CIA, FBI, Pentagon, and so on. And they were received, uh, the commissioners said to the press, uh, thanked the families and said, these questions will be a roadmap for how to do this investigation. And yet at the end of, their, of, of, the, of that journey, when the 9-11 Commission report was published in July of 2004, the families found that really only 9% of the questions have been answered with any seriousness or depth. Uh, others touched on briefly and 70% not addressed at all. And so, yes, there's lots of questions that were, were left unaddressed, uh, uh, which which left, you know, I think that th that uh, uh, omission by the 9-11 Commission, which should have created, I think, uh, uh, sustained unity on the part of the family's goodwill toward the commission throughout, because they always, Mindy Kleinberg said they were always, she was always hopeful that the, the government would answer our questions. So when they found out that the government didn't answer most of the questions, that created more disturbing questions by, you know, the silence and what that meant. So yes, there are questions still about how is it that uh, uh, no planes, uh, no uh, fighter jets that are scrambled by the U.S. Air Force on a routine basis since the late 50s, uh, it had been in, uh, a common practice. In 1956, there was the mid-air Grand Canyon collision between a military jet and a commercial flight, 128 people died. And there were several other incidents with commercial airliners flying into clouds and crashing out in the Eastern seaboard. And so uh, they put together the forerunner of the FAA back in 1958, and they said, okay, 
all these planes leaving airports, uh, the pilots have to connect with the control tower at the departure gate, make sure they have an approved flight path and an approved altitude because the traveling public wants to be assured that when they board a plane, it's not going to crash into some other plane coming in the opposite direction. And so when you then have a plane flying more than two miles off of its course or off of its altitude, it poses a real and present danger to any other plane flying in the opposite direction toward it. And so that's why the U.S. military has fighter pilots that train in many bases across the country six times a, a month. And these yeah. pilots do nothing but intercept planes in the hundreds uh, every year. And, and so they, they knew how to do this. And yet the families question to the commission and the government was, how could it be that on September 11th, that the government and the military are zero for four? in terms of intercepting the planes to do something. Well, along with that, Ray, uh, these, are, these are difficult questions. Yeah. And uh, you, you must have encountered some obstacles, either self-imposed or otherwise, when you were collecting all this information and asking questions, questions people don't necessarily want to hear, let alone answer. How did you deal with those obstacles? Well, I first of all, I mean, part of it, I have to become familiar with with thinking about things that I don't normally think about. I don't normally think about um, jets scrambling to intercept planes that are off course because there's problems with the cockpit malfunctioning with its uh, te te technology or, uh, or what happens with a, if a plane gets into trouble in a thunderstorm or, or a hurricane or whatever. So I don't think about a lot of a lot of the things that I had to start thinking about or or be curious. Um, you know, there, there are questions. Um, uh, Patty Casaza's uh, husband, John, told her in a phone call from the North Tower that he believed that there were bombs going off in the building. And and I, you know, I look at that and the families asked the question. Uh, they simply asked neutrally, I think, to ask the 9-11 Commission to just investigate reports of explosions going off in the building. And, you know, th there was no investigation into that during the 9-11 Commission, although 503 first responders in the Fire Department of New York uh, did testify in the fall and winter of 2001 to their superiors. And that 12,000 page testimony, if you'd like to read it like I did, over, a, over over 16 months, one first responder at a time, um, was posted on the New York Times online only in the 12th of, of August 2005. And, and I would be looking at the reports about, you know, okay, the fire melted the, the steel. Uh, steel normally melts at about 27, 2800 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm also reading accounts of uh, firefighters ascending of the stairs of the South Tower up to the 79th floor um, and reporting that they only need to have a few pockets of fire to put it out. Um, another person, Kevin Cosgrove, is in the South Tower, I think, talking to emergency for 15 minutes on the phone. He's able to hold the receiver of his phone. It's cool enough to hold. The cord from the phone to the wall and the jack in the wall are all not being impaired by whatever heat's going on. So there's just it's just questions that people have. And, and I don't try and say, I've tried to write my book somewhat neutrally at points to, to not, you know, point a finger anywhere, but just to say, there's a lot of questions that the families have and they're reasonable. And, and so uh, it's quick to say like things are conspiracy theories, but I think that we need to remember that that term came about in the late uh, 1880s or 1890s when police in the USA and other places had to figure out, well, we've got a crime here. How do we think this happened? And they would come up with different scenarios for how a crime might have been committed. And then they would bring it to court if there was a case to be brought to court. And then the court unfolds and then people are witnesses. And then sometimes the scenario that the police had alters because now there's a star witness that takes it in a whole new direction. Yeah. And so, um, the official account of, of the 19 hijackers involves a conspiracy, which is wherever two or three or more are gathered together to, to do something nefarious. Um, uh, nobody believed. 
Yeah. Ray, I'm going to stop you for a minute because this show is geared to parents and it's geared to kids. Mm-hmm. And I know that kids, I mean, for the most part, 9-11, they don't remember. I mean, they weren't even born yet, but there has got to be a message that you want to convey to them because, you know, this is an important thing. It's like the Holocaust. You've got to get people to think about it and to remember it. So, Based upon this question and based upon the audience that we attract, what do you want to say to them? Okay. I think that uh, this is a story that's important in many ways, part, partly because nearly 3,000 people died and we want to understand something about it. It's also a very important story because for many people, when something happens, uh, a tragedy like this, and I've talked to numbers of family members who've told me that what happened to them afterwards was they got depressed for 10 years and had to see a therapist, or they turned to alcohol or drugs and eventually got over that. And that, that's an understandable uh, response to, to something horrible that's happened close up and personal. But these families, like people like Kristen Breitweiser with a two-year-old daughter, now widowed, and others decided not to just tuck in and have a private life. They decided to go to Washington, D.C. They decided to knock on the doors of their members of Congress and other Congress men and women and other senators and speak to them and call the White House and lobby in the Capitol and speak in front of joint inquiries and the 9-11 Commission. I mean, this is a remarkable thing to do. It's, it's not expected at all that anyone who has suffered this kind of loss would decide to do anything more than just try and, and heal and grieve and, and move on at some point. So it's a very surprising story about resilience and, uh, and also how sometimes grief and the circumstances of of something that's happened like this uh, can turn people's grief to a, a clarion call for truth and accountability as they understand it. And I want to say, too, that the story is not a story about uh, 12 people on the Family Steering Committee who are being partisan Democrats. Uh, I don't know. I mean, not every American adult votes every year in the uh, midterms or the presidential election. And I, I don't know for sure if all 12 Family Steering Committee members voted in 2000. But I do know of five who were on record with the press as saying how they did vote. And three of those five voted for the Bush-Cheney ticket. And so this is not a story about a partisan effort. It's a story about families just wanting to to know what they could do to make their nation safe. It's also a story about how power and the need to protect things that we may not understand still gets in the way of that story of of the effort. And so it's a story, too, about how when the 9-11 Commission, after 14 months of stonewalling, Uh, finally gets up and running, uh, they're only given $3 million to run their investigation compared to, I don't know, 60, 70 million for the investigating the Clintons with Vince Foster, Whitewater, and Monica Lewinsky in the 90s. So so, uh, you have Lee Hamilton, who's appointed to be the co-chair, who happens to have been involved with the Iran-Contra inquiry, uh, on, on that inquiry, who, who said to the press, he talked to Oliver North and couldn't believe that Oliver North would ever lie to him. He's also someone who was a long-term best friend, having vacations with Pres- Vice President Dick Cheney and Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. Um, someone who didn't want, Lee Hamilton didn't want any public hearings, didn't want any subpoenas, didn't want to have people swearing under oath. So it's a story that's a very odd story about how to not do an investigation. And Lori Van Auken has said that, uh, you know, this is just the whole, we were, we were there, we sat through it, and it was just not run in a way that you would want to investigate anything if you want to get to the bottom of it. So I think it can also be a story for people that read my book and for others that are, are younger listening to this show uh, to think about the times where there are people in authority who have told you don't look under this rock. You know, maybe you're, maybe you're in recess in grade five and something has happened amongst your, your schoolmates. And 
you know that something is fishy or something is wrong. And all the people in charge tell you to, to just back off. Well, uh, but maybe you don't. And eventually people listen to you and, uh, and you get another hearing, you know, and this is a story of, of that too. In the case of adult adults that said that we want our government to do the right thing. And so I think that that's an important part of this story. I think also, Ray, there's a secondary message here that I want the viewers to see, uh, the parents and certainly the, the teens, is that uh, there was the tremendous amount of work to do the research. The truth doesn't always slap you in the face. You really have to uncover that rock, lift the rock up, turn it over, look underneath it. Then you had to write about it and bring that message. So I want to thank you for doing that. But uh, what is, is next for Ray McGinnis? Well, what, what is next for me? Yeah. Well, I think I've got about, I've got about uh, 15 more interviews coming up in the next two weeks. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I, I mean, here I am, I've only bought, you see, I've got this little UBS headset yeah, and fine. microphone. I only got this about three weeks ago when I had to be coached on how to even connect this to my computer and learn how to find uh, something besides the default of just the, the, the sound and the computer. Right. So, I mean, I'm learning a lot about just even how to speak to the media. Media, but I'm also I'm also talking to uh, you know some you know I've got people who are family members uh, who lost loved ones on September 11th. Numbers of them are contacting me through LinkedIn and my website. So I'm you know I'm having I talked to one person earlier today who wanted to talk to me about about the book I've written and wants to get it. So I'm talking to you know some people who are first responders and family members and. It's, uh, you know, I, I mean, I want to say, too, when I wrote this book, I was maybe I'm just too darn humble, but there was a point when I'd, writ I'd written a lot of it. I went through about five drafts and how to write this book. And I took it to somebody who I knew who was uh, uh, an American author who'd written quite a number of books. And I said, you know, I've written this book. I've just written one book. This is, a, this is a, a story for the world to hear, but it's also a story, especially for Americans to think about. And I said, you know, I'm happy to be the ghostwriter. You can, you can take this book and put your name on it, and I'm happy to give it to you. And they, they told me that I shouldn't do that. But, <laughs> but I mean, I, you know, I didn't want this book to be about me. But anyway, here, here I am now talking to the media, talking to family members, talking to some first responders. And hopefully, um, you know, I think that that is going to be what's what's on my radar for a while. Uh, I I know that there are many things that interest me, but the the uniqueness about this story is it, it, the years kept on turning. Uh, you know, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen years. And yes, there were a few books that did mention the family steering committee in the context more broadly of the family's resilience or in some way championing people or admiring them. But this particular story of all that they did between 2001 and 2005 was just off the radar. I was waiting for somebody, some journalist to write this book, a book like I've done, but um, I, it fell to me. So I would have to be waiting for another elephant in the room to decide what I'm gonna, <laughs> what I'm gonna course. pick up on, but but believe me, I I will be uh, I'll be looking to see what what I think uh, needs to be said in the in the time ahead. Right. Well, Ray Ray McGinnis, I can't thank you enough for joining us today and sharing your passion, not just your passion, your courage for writing such an important and powerful book. And of course, always to Susan Brenner, thanks for being with us today as well. This is Mark Hoberman thanking you for watching Light of the Educational Flame. Catch us Monday nights at 9 p.m. EST on E360 TV, on Roku, Apple TV, uh, Amazon Fire. Remember, uh, we're 24 seven on the Light of the Educational Flame YouTube channel. Have a great day and Ray McGinnis, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank okay. you. Susan. Thank you for watching Lighting the Educational Flame. To contact Mark Hoberman, email him at info at gradesuccess.com or visit him on social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Thank you for watching Lighting the Educational Flame.